Welcome, I'm Lorelei Tanji. I'm the university librarian. And we're very excited to have you all come to the Francisco J. Ayala Science Library for the exhibit opening of Water in California, Issues, Impacts, and Innovation. And we're so excited by this. This is a special exhibit. It's really bringing together scientific speakers, dance, and artwork all inspired by water, and it represents both the interdisciplinary collaborations across the campus, as well as the community engagement, which are key goals of the UCI strategic plan. This exhibit is made possible due to some wonderful partnerships with these four entities, the Water UCI, which is part of the School of Social Ecology, the Henry Samueli School of Engineering, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts, and the Lakeside Middle School, part of the Irvine Unified School District. Next, I'd like to acknowledge our exhibit curators. I'm gonna start off with Dr. Shannon Roback, and she is the Assistant Director of Water UCI, and a postdoctoral research associate at the Orange County Water District. She received her doctorate at UCLA, where her research analyzed the formation of carcinogens in drinking water treatment plants. And at UCI, she developed an outreach program called Water UCI Middle School Conservation Challenge. And this connects UCI students with students at local middle schools. And what it does is it teaches them about water scarcity in California. Now, Dr. Roback uh, coordinated an art contest with the students at Lakeside Middle School, and it was focused on water. And so selections from the students' artwork are presented on the exhibit walls and also on our digital display, and we're thrilled to have their artwork exhibited along with our library collections and the research of the faculty at UCI. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Roback and any of the students from Lakeside Middle School in the audience to stand for recognition. And now our other curator, Julia Gelfin, has been with the UCI Library since 1981 and has worked with several schools and many departments as the Applied Sciences and Engineering Librarian. And she has a BA from Goucher College and an MSLS and MA from Case Western Reserve University. Her research interests are in gray literature, collection development, and scholarly communication, especially in the sciences. Julia has written, presented, and served as a consultant internationally in all of these areas, and I'd like to invite her to stand up and be acknowledged. So thank you, Julia and Shannon, for curating this exhibit and also for your program ideas. Um, next, I would like to acknowledge all of the many library staff who helped to make this program possible. So thank me, thank you for all of your help and join me in thanking them. And now to begin our exciting program, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Lisa Noggle. She is the department chair of dance in the UCI Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Uh, Professor Noggle was a member of the Nancy Hauser Dance Company and has performed with several companies in the United States and Canada. Her current research and creative activity centers on computer-based applications for dance, including motion capture, telematic performance, and interactive technology. Uh, Professor Noggle and the UCI dance students have choreographed original pieces inspired by the interdisciplinary nature of water. Please come up, Professor Noggle. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for uh, being here and appreciating the dance that you'll see in a couple of moments. So on behalf of the dance department and Claire Trevor School of the Arts, we are presenting two pieces today. The first one is choreographed by a graduate student, Elizabeth Schultz, who's here on the side, and uh, it was part of her, part of some of the thesis work that she was working on regarding women and support and water and 
flow and a variety of things. So I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity for her to share some of that work. Um, but before we see that piece, I would like to thank a couple of people. Of course, Lorelai Tanji for inviting us, and uh, Cherie Bob, and Sharla Beatty, Beatty, and Kate Gaffney, and Julie Gelfand, and all of the staff and uh, everyone who made this possible today. So here we go with the first piece, which is called At the Seams.
second piece is um, was a really wonderful opportunity also. Um, I gave us uh, undergraduate students in the chore beginning choreography class an opportunity to research some of the water issue, water issues, not the water issues, but there are many issues. Mm -hmm. And so they started to um, spend the quarter really looking at sustainability and uh, erosion and decay and many, many, many uh, things. So reflections. And so this work is really a collaboration between all the, uh, the students who uh, did the research this quarter. There's actually 30 students in the cl class, but um, many of them are preparing for our annual Dance Visions concert tonight. So they're over at a different theater. But these students say, I can do it anyway. I really want to do it. And they really enjoy the research process. So um, thank you very much. And hope you enjoyed this one as well.
Well, thank you very much, UCI dance students and Professor Noggle. That was really an amazing, powerful performance. Let's give them one big more round of applause here. I just want to say that we want to reassure you that we've captured this performance on videotape and we'll be putting it up on a monitor so that people can come and visit, view it, and appreciate it throughout the duration of this exhibit. It's just amazing. And now we have our um, two scientific speakers. Um, I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions until after both of their presentations and then we'll have a group Q&A. And so first, let me uh, say a few words of introduction about our first speaker, Dr. David Feldman, Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy and Political Science at the UCI School of Social Ecology. He's also the director of Water UCI. And Professor Feldman specializes in water resources management policy, global climate change policy, and ethics and environmental decisions. And his current research is on green infrastructure and urban water policy, transboundary dispute resolution and water, flood risk communication, and the challenges in achieving institutional reform to promote equity and water management. So please join me in welcoming up Professor Feldman. Good evening. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. As you look around this room and you look at the exhibits tonight, one of the things that's very striking is that there's a lot of history in water in California. I'm also reminded that this is true throughout the world. We have some visitors from Israel this week that we are meeting with and collaborating with. And I remember a statement that was once made by the late King Hussein of Jordan that said that the Jordan River has more history than water. Uh, and that is certainly true, and we could say much the same about California. What I want us to do for the next few minutes, as we think about the exhibits and what they say about the history of water, is to think about a future history. We often think, as the Bard reminds us, that the past serves as a prologue. But a prologue to what? What kind of a future? Do we have to have a future in water management and policy here in California and around the world that's just like the past? Or can we choose a different future, an ennobled future, a future that embraces environmental sustainability, and a future that embraces water justice for all? So as we think about that, I want to talk about the possibility of a future history. And I want to begin, appropriately enough, with uh, the notion of California as a hydraulic society, and really a tale of two states. And so as we think about our golden bear suffering under our recent drought, one of the things that we can uh, ponder is how the exhibits around this room chronicle the past, but also maybe help shape the future. It seems to me that we really face two interrelated challenges, a choice between two models of water management. The way we've often practiced it in California and elsewhere is a top-down model. But there is a bottom-up model, one that embraces public engagement, participation, social justice. We also face the challenge of a need for continued innovation, and you're going to learn more about that a little later on through Dr. Grant's remarks. The top-down model accords historically with what we call a hydraulic society. The question, as I'm going to address in just a moment, is whether or not this model has to be the future as well as our past. What do I mean by a hydraulic society? Well, California, as all of you know, is the world's, by most accounts, eighth largest economy. And that economy was built on our ability to harness water to economic growth. Historically, elites, people in positions of great power, exercised control over both the water resource and over the infrastructure that moved water from one place to another. 
They also exercised control over water law and water policy. The goals of every hydraulic society, historians tell us, is to achieve security in water supply, stability, and prosperity. And this map that shows our elaborate plumbing system throughout the western United States, and especially California, shows just how successful we really have been through institutions as well as infrastructure in harnessing water to these goals. But when we think of a hydraulic society, and we think of the legacies, both good and bad, maybe we need to step back even a little further. How about the Roman Empire? Uh, this Pont de Gare aqueduct in southern France uh, no longer delivers water, but it still stands, a testimony to what good infrastructure can look like, as opposed to some of our infrastructural challenges today in the United States. The public bath in Pompeii, which of course was uncovered after archaeologists explored through the ruins of the uh, volcanic eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, is also a testimony to the Romans' penchant for harnessing water institutions, water law, and water infrastructure. The Romans viewed water management as a means of ensuring public health and personal comfort. Diverting water great distances enabled cities and colonies to grow. It connected territories and it enabled the development of agriculture and trade. And the building and the maintaining of infrastructure was the responsibility of the state, as it is in California today. Rome was the world's largest city in the first century AD, somewhere over a million people, largely because it was able to harness and control water. Uh, Sextus Julius Frontinus, who was the first, let's just call him the first water manager of Rome in the first century uh, AD, as you can see, uh, took great pride in the fact that the Emperor Nerva had appointed him and conferred upon him great power, uh, and that he took that power very, very seriously, and that he felt that he had a responsibility to a notion of a public good. In reading this quote by uh, Sextus Julius Frontinus, I think of many of the laments that modern day water agency managers have about the responsibilities that they are faced with. So why is this important? Well, California too was founded as a hydraulic society, as I noted before. Think back to early statehood from 1850 to the 1880s. The harnessing of water led to the growth steady growth of cities like Los Angeles. As we have to remind many ourselves often, as, a, as I've often told my students, Los Angeles was not founded on the ocean, it was founded on a river. And that river was the main source of water supply for orchards, for farms, and for metropolitan use. And in fact, where the plaza is today was actually a reservoir. In addition, ditches, hand dug, zanjas, including the original Zanha, which is still has traces near the Los Angeles Plaza today. The Zanha Madre also provided power for the grinding of grain and, of course, the growth of the local economy. And as you can see on this map to the right, a very elaborate system of ditches distributed water by gravity feed throughout the infant city. Needless to say, the harnessing of water under this hydraulic society model also transformed our state into a large exporter of food and fiber via massive engineering projects, including crop irrigation that was permitted in the Central Valley through, this is not a river, this is instead the California Aqueduct, a key component of the state water project, the Central Valley projects portion of the state water project. And as you can see in this figure on the right, which is produced by uh, agricultural irrigation agencies in the Central Valley, uh, there is an ethos of not only harnessing water, but trying to use every drop to the extent possible to make sure that the security, the stability, and most importantly, the prosperity of this agricultural empire remains intact. Beginning in the late 19th century, after this early period of develop, the economy of California began to flourish and our population grew. And as our population grew, of course, water demands, as we know, increased. 
And as that happened, we sought to harness new sources of water to feed what other historians call the growth machine, which is very much the ethos of California water ethics. In the early 1900s, prior to the 1906 earthquake, San Francisco, not Los Angeles, was California's largest city. It was also the largest city in the Western United States. But it was freshwater limited. So in an effort to seek to expand its water supply, uh, the proposition came forth from the city of San Francisco to dam this river, the Hetch Hetchy, which originated within the confines of Yosemite National Park. Beautiful, pristine, untouched. The same place today, perhaps beautiful in a different way, hardly pristine, and very definitely not untouched. O'Shaughnessy Dam was completed in 1913, the same year that the Los Angeles Aqueduct to Owens Valley was completed. And it was supported by no less than Gifford Pinchot, the father of the US Forest Service, and President Teddy Roosevelt. They believed that the growth and the harnessing of natural resources, including water, was actually the way to be a good conservationist to find a way to put resources to work for the engine of growth, not just the preservation of nature. John Muir, as many of you know, who resided in Yosemite, was a principal opponent of Hetch Hetchy, and as a result of this project, his supporters formed the Sierra Club. That was really its origins, opposition to this project. The debate and the changes that this kind of a project wrought, which I mentioned were not without controversy, this debate continues today. Five years ago, Bay Area voters voted on a proposition called Prop F. And they defeated this prop by an overwhelming margin. The proposition, had it passed, would have demolished O'Shaughnessy Dam in an effort to replace the Hetch Hetchy Valley to its prior development conditions. But the proposition also required that the city of San Francisco identify replacement water and power sources. Since decision makers were not able to identify those sources ahead of time, we believe that's why the proposition probably went down to a resounding defeat. But again, the debate still continues, and we'll see from time to time debates over tearing down water projects. Of course, Southern California isn't alone in this. In the early 20th century, Los Angeles' population, as we know, doubled every 10 years. And civic leaders sought a reliable source whose rights they could obtain easily. Owens Valley, some 230 miles to the north of the city on the eastern slope of the Sierra, seemed to fit the bill perfectly. The challenges, however, challenges that remain today, are some questions that we're still agonizing over. Exactly whose development aspirations should prevail? The city of Los Angeles or the residents of the Owens Valley? And how should decisions over harnessing a water source be made? Should they be made in secret by these three gentlemen, J.P. Lippincott, Fred Eaton, and William Mulholland, probably the only water engineer in America to have a romantic highway named after him? Uh, should this be made by a small elite, or should it have been open to a wider public and societal debate? That's a debate that still continues. Many of you know the terminus of the aqueduct is in the San Fernando Valley near Silmar, and in fact, much of the water from the aqueduct was originally used to irrigate orchards and farms in the San Fernando Valley, not for urban uses. November 1913, when the aqueduct opened, Mulholland pointed proudly to the outfall and said, there it is, take it. As if to say, almost as a Roman emperor might, I've provided it for you. It was not without controversy, as this picture on the bottom right shows. Uh, people in the Owens Valley sought at various junctures to thwart the efforts to build and maintain the aqueduct, including in some cases dynamiting it as this photograph in 1927 shows. By the way, old versions of the LA Times described these kinds of incidents as domestic terrorism. 
When we think about harnessing water for a hydraulic society, let's not forget harbors and ports. Toward a Pacific Empire, the 19th century political fights erupted here in Southern California over where harbors should be constructed. Some wanted a harbor in Santa Monica, others in San Pedro. Still others chose San Diego, which already seemed to have a natural harbor. In 1897, the debate was settled by elites who petitioned Congress to establish a board of engineers who then recommended San Pedro be expanded and the federal government offered to pay for the expansion. Was Los Angeles the best place for a port? Perhaps, but we definitely know the brokers of power won out, and that was how the debate was really determined. In 1909, shortly after the port was established, Los Angeles annexed San Pedro and Wilmington to assure political control over the harbor, and it is now, of course, the largest port complex in the entire Western Hemisphere. Other legacies of California's hydraulic society. The diversion of the Owens Valley that I alluded to before depleted Owens and Mono Lakes, creating dust problems and ecological degradation, toxic levels of heavy metals and other substances borne aloft by a dry lake bed and high winds in the Inland Empire. In 1994, the City of Los Angeles, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Water and Power, and two counties in the Owens Valley, Mono and Inyo, settled with an agreement to effectively restore the Owens and Mono lakes, not so much for the water, but for air quality. All right? uh, it also did require restoration of the Owens River and the restocking of fisheries. In 2013, just a few years ago, a stream restoration agreement actually required Los Angeles to restore stream flows to historic levels, and they are working at that effort right now as we speak. And since 2014, the good news is that Los Angeles and the Owens Valley seem to be working together to monitor the Owens and Mono Lakes and determine when and how much water can be released. Some things are being restored, however, regional income remains dependent in the Owens Valley on tourism, not on agriculture, not on prospects of massive future economic development. So these are things to think about. How about the gold rush? Water was involved there. We all know that. Hydraulic mining, these techniques were called, and many of the ecological legacies of the devastation still persist today in parts of the Sacramento Valley, for example, and the American rivers. Erosion and water depletion were extensively generated by these practices. And it does explain the good news why California adopted laws beginning in the 1880s to promote what is called regulated withdrawal and beneficial use of the people's water. Those laws are still on the books, variously enforced. Many of my students know that Los Angeles does still have a river, although it doesn't quite run through it the way it used to. It was the principal source of water supply for Los Angeles. It is now mostly a floodway, although there are efforts afoot to restore it. The question is, can it be restored? By whom? And for what objectives? There is a revitalization plan which wants to remove channelization through much of the river, to replant native vegetation, and to develop greenways to improve water quality, open space, job creation, and a fostering of civic and community pride. The Obama administration four years ago came out in support of a billion dollar startup. Where that will stand today, we don't know. We'll still have to kind of wait and see where things go and if it becomes part of a infrastructure redevelopment plan. There is a corporation that's been formed to guide riparian corridor development. But a lot of questions remain, as many of you know. Is it restoration or is it gentrification? Warehouses and other properties are becoming lofts and businesses with adjacent pocket parks for those wealthy enough perhaps to afford 
to live and to rent properties for business, commercial use, and residential use. Rents are rising sharply. Fears that older, lower-income families may be displaced is a real concern. In fact, this is a concern whenever urban rivers are restored. Can restoration afford the opportunity to move away from a hydraulic society to a more bottom-up approach? That's a rhetorical question, but it doesn't require a rhetorical answer. There are bottom-up approaches that are also part of California's water past, and they could be part of an alternative future. These are Native American tribes, paintings trying to duplicate, replicate what life was like and the relationship to water. Prior to European conquest, California tribes understood things like seasonality. They relied on coastal resources. They had a symbiotic relationship with nature, what we might call a water-sensitive ethic. Water claims, of course, were forcibly taken from Native Americans after Spanish conquest, and it worsened when California became a state. Today, numerous of these tribes have actually filed suit against California and other western states to try and recoup some of these water rights and to try to protect their legacy of water management. But can this water-sensitive model be an alternative future? Can we, for instance, capture stormwater? And there are many proposals on the table some of which are being instituted in various forms here in Southern California today. Los Angeles captures some 27,000 acre feet a year, mostly for recharging the San Fernando Basin. Can that be tripled or even quadrupled by, let's say, 2035, via a number of centralized and decentralized approaches? To do so, cities, in the Los Angeles Basin will have to implement low-impact measures to capture that runoff. It'll require changes not just in governance and in infrastructure, but in public attitudes. And most importantly, it will require cooperation among local leaders to see this kind of model as not just a quaint past, but an opportune future. Conservation definitely can be a part of that future. Here in Irvine, and in many other places in Southern California, we employ allocation-based rate structure systems, tiered systems that reduce residential water use by as much as half. Utilities can even apply a property-specific water budget to a household to ensure equity in water management. Water smart billing systems can show you and I exactly how much water we're using compared to the average user in our, let's say, uh, zip code, and efficient households. We would like to be in line with our neighbors. Most of us would. We call this norming. Incentives to reduce outdoor uses have taken place in other parts of the Southwest, even remarkably in Las Vegas, which has reduced outdoor use by 75%. On the other hand, although we might applaud this gentleman's effort to shame people in West LA, uh, it doesn't work very well. We appreciate the bottom-up effort. The world is watching a lot more, says Tony Corcoran, one of several people who spend their spare time canvassing communities of Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, and elsewhere, looking for people wasting water. But as the caption notes, not everyone is happy about it. Uh, one woman quickly tiring of his lecture on conservation while she watered her plants, turned her hose on him. <laughs> Wastewater reuse. It's both past and prologue. What these pictures are designed to show is that throughout history, fresh water has always been reused. But when we reuse wastewater for potable uses today through the application of technology, we're accelerating a process that nature first began. And whether we're talking about Julius Caesar, George Washington, Mao Zedong, or Madeline Walsam, one of the students whom we took to Australia a couple years ago, and then with other UC students, we visited the Orange County Groundwater Replenishment Plant uh, was one of the consumers of the water coming from that groundwater replenishment system.
And she's still doing fine, by the way. In areas with environmental justice concerns, however, reuse may arouse mistrust, especially among underrepresented groups. So concerted outreach and public engagement are needed. Fortunately, this is something we have learned in Orange County, and it's something that other places around the state and around the nation are beginning to learn. So, whoops, choices we face, a hydraulic society or a water-sensitive future. Consider climate challenges aren't new. We've always been deniers of the impacts of climate change here in California. Um, rain will follow the plow. That used to be an axiom of westward migration. Native Americans were not ignorant of climate change. Is there a lesson here, perhaps for us? And don't blame population growth. Profligate consumption isn't caused by how many of us use water. It's caused by how we use water. Large-scale, publicly subsidized water projects are partly responsible for inducing our wasteful uses in California and elsewhere. And there are no panaceas. We need large-scale infrastructure. We need to fix dams where they're broken. We need to repair aqueducts. But we also need adaptive options that are flexible, that generate fewer adverse impacts, and that help ensure a resilient future. As this chart on Proposition 1, which is an effort by the state of California to nurture projects that partner communities and various community groups around such projects. So, rather than repeat past mistakes, we can go back to the future. If it's the right future, and as this Native American in this painting suggests, uh, better enjoy this now before someone comes and pollutes it, wastes it, limits access to it, sells it for $2 a bottle, and then calls it progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Feldman, for such an inspiring and informative presentation. And now um, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our second speaker, Professor Stanley Grant. His professional interests include human and ecosystem water security, coastal and drinking water quality, and environmental fate and transport modeling. Professor Grant is currently PI and director of two center grants focused on urban water sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Professor Grant. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. And we've got the dance performances and then David giving a wonderful, eloquent um, exposition. Any chance we can have another dance performance? <laughs> It might be way more interesting. Um, well, anyway, thank you very much for, for inviting me to, um, to you know, this wonderful event. Um, I've been at UCI for 26 years. It's hard to believe. That's a big chunk of my life. And, um, and it's a very, very special place. So um, I don't know why, but, but maybe it was the dance performance. But somehow it seems very emotional today. So thank you for, for inviting me into your, your afternoon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Water 4.0, which is a vision that um, one of our brethren faculty at, in the north uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, David Sedlak, um, really coined um, in a textbook or a book, a very easy to read book actually, um, that he wrote a couple of years ago. And so I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. I really, it expands on what David's already said to you, I think, in many ways. Um, so I guess I would say that if, if you were to like boil it down, like my father might do, <laughs> um, uh, you know, what is the challenge with urban water supply? Um, it's basically it's a tale of too many people and too little water. So uh, and and you know we bring the water as David pointed out. We are a very hydraulically efficient society. We tend to um, grow the society as well, and that leads to uh, struggles. So um, so in David Sedlak's book, basically what he says is that you can view the history of water uh, through as a series of revolutions. And so um, uh, David Feldman already mentioned the ancient Romans and, and their uh, focus on the hydraulic society, which was about bringing water uh, to Roman cities. 
And so that David refers to as water 1.0. That is the idea that, that you could harness hydraulic engineering to move water over large distances and bring it so it's conveniently available for um, the population in your city. So that was water 1.0. And that worked really, really well. Uh, but as um, cities became uh, more populated, more dense, um, and there became the opportunity for disease to spread through the water supply system, uh, we started to see more and more outbreaks of, of really horrible diseases like cholera, which we can't really even imagine today. Well, actually, they, they do occur uh, in the world, especially after disasters. But certainly in our um, sort of urban setting here, we don't uh, think about it. But anyway, cholera was a really big problem, a scourge that nobody could you know, seem to get rid of. And so basically water 2.0 was the realization that you could take the water supply and run it through a filter and essentially remove the disease causing contaminant, whatever that was, um, and, and then you know, drink the water safely. And so that was really water 2.0. And that, that worked up until the mid-1900s. And then um, basically what we began to realize is that the sewage that we were discharging, so it was a very one pass-through system, right? We, we take the water from some source, maybe from a very far away distant source, we bring it to our cities, we run it through a filter, we drink it, we use it, and then it goes into this, you know, the sewer lines, uh, the sewage collection system, and then it's discharged to the environment. And then that part of the, the system was um, demonstrating a lot of damage, both to the ecosystem and then also uh, potentially human health problems as well. And so a water 3.0, David would say, is, is really about bringing sewage treatment plants into that cycle. So essentially removing a lot of the organic material, maybe some of the nitrogen, which can cause algal blooms uh, from, uh, from the sewage and also pathogens. And so oddly, we're kind of in a water 3.5. We're a little beyond maybe that water 3.0, which really began in earnest maybe in the 1950s. But our current systems, uh, even in a uh, highly developed country like the United States, are highly centralized systems for essentially water supply treatment and distribution, sewage collection treatment and disposal, and stormwater drainage. These are separate systems. They're separately managed. They're extremely centralized, and they're very, very expensive to build, maintain, and operate. And, um, and basically, we're kind of up against a wall. We're probably squeezed all the juice we're going to squeeze out of our water 3.5. And so what David argues is that we really need a fourth revolution, which is what he coined water 4.0. And, and basically, that is actually happening. And, and in some cases, scholars refer to this as a new epoch in human history, where we are really turning earnestly to what would have been considered poor quality sources historically. We're treating that water. We're using it for, for purpose activities. So we don't need um, highly treated water, for example, to flush our toilets. Um, but what, what's really interesting from an academic perspective and from an engineering perspective is that what we're really thinking about with the Water 4.0 is a hybrid system which has these components of centralized treatment that have worked so well for such a long time, but also have very localized distributed components to them, which uh, basically improve uh, sort of water productivity, uh, encourage conservation. Um, and also um, sort of lead to a, a greener city, a, a more livable city. Uh, and so in one of the, um, in a review article that my colleagues and I wrote a couple of years back, we uh, sort of articulated that vision along with many other people. And one way to think about it is breaking free of the water grid. So we're really right now kind of tied to this centralized water grid system that delivers water and then collects it and takes it away. Um, and so if we want to break free of that water grid, and there's all sorts of efficiencies associated with breaking free, really it's going to look something like this, not too bad, where essentially you have localized capture of, uh, for example, rainwater and stormwater that's running off your streets. You, you employ some natural treatment systems like um, the green, what looks like a lawn, but actually it's a filter. It's called a biofilter where the water comes in, moves through a soil media, and then is collected on, uh, on that um, back end. And that, can, that treated water can either be used directly for fit for purpose activities or run through further treatment uh, for even potentially potable use. So the key thing to note here is that there's conservation involved. There's um, water collection and treatment at, at lots of different scales, both uh, sort of large scale and small scale. 
Um, and also there's natural treatment systems which have the effect of greening the city and, and um, sort of other ecosystem benefits. And in fact, this is kind of a, um, one of the charts that we thought about when we wrote our latest proposal, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, which basically summarizes the many, many benefits that are associated with having that distributed uh, centralized hybrid model. Um, and so if we're talking about, for example, capturing stormwater and using um, green infrastructure to uh, pretreat it, uh, obviously there's human co-benefits associated with water provisioning. Um, there's also cultural benefits associated with creating green spaces, for example, education opportunities, for example, on this campus if we had such uh, features. Um, but they also play a role in sort of the physics of urban communities. For example, temperature regulation, carbon sequestration, flood control, so we um, maybe can rely less on uh, what, what is increasingly becoming kind of an outdated flood control system. Um, and then in addition to all of those human benefits, we also have enormous ecosystem co-benefits. What do I mean by that? Well, we're reducing pollutant loading to uh, downstream receiving waters. For example, we live pretty close to Newport Bay, and really interestingly, 70% of the runoff from UCI drains to a single outlet, which just so happens to be downstream of the mass emission sta um, station for uh, the county. And so everything that we emit essentially flows into Newport Bay without any detection or sensing whatsoever. So, um, so to the extent that we can capture runoff, we can hold that back we can treat appropriately, we do our, our ecosystem, in this case, Newport Bay as service. We create urban habitats for uh, invertebrates. You may not care very much about invertebrates personally, but they perform a lot of ecosystem services, which are incredibly important. Um, and then create habitat for uh, larger animals, um, megafauna, diversity, and, and functional traits. So there's both ecosystem reasons to do this as well as, as um, really uh, clear human reasons to do this as well. So the challenge moving forward is that the basically, as David alluded to, the built and managed structures that really are required for going to water 4.0 don't exist. And they have to account for both water quality, quantity, quality, um, the fact that we have individual and organizational actors who are going to play a really big role and the natural, social, and built environment. And um, I wanted to share this graph, I know it's a little bit busy, but it's from a group of researchers in Utah it's called, uh, the, they call it their Integrating Structure and Actors and Water, or ISAW, framework for thinking about what happens when you try to change one component of the water system that, that we rely on. And basically, the bottom line is that at the top there, it's operational water use and management. So if we wanted to move toward a hybrid system, that would automatically then, if you follow the cycle around, affect both the quantity and quality of water that was available to us. And that would in turn affect both the ecosystems as well as our behavior and our perceptions. So we saw, I think, with the dance performances, you know, a beautiful visualization of what water can mean to us at a very visceral level. All of these things that we're talking about, if we change urban water systems, can have a visceral effect. And those perceptions in turn feed back to actors in a nonlinear way. So that can affect organizations and individuals who in turn can affect more change through operational management. Um, so anyway, the bottom line is that these are very complicated systems, but really you just have to nudge a piece of it in the right direction and maybe the whole thing will follow. That's certainly the hope. Um, and I just wanted to share with you an example of something that we've been thinking about. We've been cooperating with the local utility here, the Irvine Ranch Water District, and looking at some of their very interesting data. Um, they offered a cash for grass rebate program uh, about five years ago. They started offering it, uh, in which they essentially, and some of you may have participated in this, uh, provided $2 per square foot of turf that you replaced with uh, xeric landscaping or uh, drought tolerant landscaping. Uh, David referred to the fact that something like 60 to 70 percent um, of, of water use in the home in Southern California is outdoor water use. So basically uh, irrigating uh, typically turf grass. So any effort that moves us away from turf grass is really important in terms of water conservation. So. Um, so we were looking at, in the data, the influence of things like the built environment, demographics, and social, potentially social diffusion, like if, if I do something, does that affect my neighbor's um, patterns of behavior as well? And I just wanted to show you this map. So this is a map of the um, 
the water district's uh, sort of utility area. Um, actually, it turns out that, and I'm sure many of you know this, Irvine's broken into a number of villages, right? And each of these villages is somewhat unique. Um, and so when we analyze the probability that somebody is going to participate in the turf rebate program, what we found is there was enormous variability in the probability, over a hundredfold variations so in the dark red, you have regions where there was a lot of participation in the program, and then light red or pink, uh, very, very little participation. So tremendous amount of variability. The other thing that we found is that if you look at, at um, the application rates, how, you know, how many applications came in uh, in each month, that's the black curve there, you can see a tremendous amount of variability over time. And does anyone have any idea what the peak in April of 2015 was or corresponded to? Yes, Governor Brown mandated 25% reduction and that wasn't probably his his godlike powers that caused this to happen, but it was the mass media that followed. And you can see that in Google search rates. Uh, basically, there's an enormous peak in the, um, the rate at which people were searching the terms uh, drought tolerant landscaping. And that mirrors very, very closely then the behavior of this community in terms of stepping up and, um, and actually participating. So it really goes back to that perception. You just need a little nudge and you can change everything. And so this is kind of a, a sort of hypothesis, a work in progress that, that we um, are playing with to think about um, this program. And it really fits within that ISA framework that we talked about earlier, where you have external influences, you have climate, you know, local variable, near-term variability, and maybe longer-term variability, as well as, well as political events, like the governor's uh, mandate for a 25% reduction sort of influencing um, whatever policy the utility is offering, in this case, a cash for grass program. Um, and then maybe internal endogenous things going on, like uh, in, me influencing my neighbor to step up and do, you know, do the same that I'm doing, uh, that leads to essentially very skewed distributions where some neighborhoods have massively invested in this um, activity and then some have not. So I think unpacking this uh, you know, and, and similar kinds of problems are what we need to do as researchers uh, and engineers, frankly, to help the utilities think about what they need to move toward that water 4.0 future um, and uh, away from the hydraulic society, I think, that, that David Feldman so um, nicely described. The other thing I just wanted to say is that another way we can nudge the future is by writing proposals as proposal, or as professors have to write proposals to get money right in front of graduate students. But the really great thing about it is that we can also sometimes affect change. And so um, we received a, um, a multi-campus grant from the UC Office of the President last year to look at the five southern UC campuses as essentially test beds for capturing stormwater runoff. So if we captured all of the stormwater runoff that came off of each of these five campuses, you know, what would we do with that water? Uh, what kind of green infrastructure could we build? Um, and what would it imply in terms of the water portfolio that currently exists on the campuses? Lots of really interesting questions. And that leads to collaborations with computer scientists who then think about, you know, how could maybe we have real-time control, uh, cyber physical systems, which help us manage this very complex distributed and centralized hybrid system. So, um, so anyway, that's something that we're working on right now. Again, the five southern UC campuses are involved, uh, as well as some of the local utilities. And so um, with that, I think I will uh, just thank everybody for coming today, and, um, and thanks for listening to me instead of demanding, as I would have done, uh, to see another dance performance. <laughs> Actually, now is the time for Q&A, so I'm going to ask both Professor Grant and Professor Feldman to come back up here, and we do have people with microphones around so that you can answer any of the questions from our audience. We have about five minutes, so don't mind coming back up again. California is slipping into another another drought. Are we any better off this time than last time? Any better prepared than last time? I 
think we're better prepared in the sense that we have some idea, certainly our decision makers and our water agencies have an idea of just how bad things could become. That coupled with the fact that while water use has ramped up since the drought ended, it has not ramped up fully to levels pre-drought. So in that sense, I guess I would say we're maybe a little more ready than we were maybe in the past, but there's still so much we need to do. And I think fundamentally, when, when I think of the question, are we prepared, uh, I think we really have been grabbing what economists would call the low-hanging fruit. We've been doing a lot of very easy things. The things that are really, very really hard to do, Stan and I have worked together in places like Australia, Stan knows better than I, uh, it really takes some concerted efforts at every level of governance and at every level of civil society, and I don't quite think we're there yet. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to amplify. I think that, um, you know, I always think about the tale of two cities. Um, in Australia, there's a great paper that came out a couple of years ago looking at um, sort of the energy use for water uh, as well as the water use per person in two different regions of Australia, Southeast Queensland and Perth. And in those regions, when they confronted drought, and the millennium drought in Australia was this epic drought. I mean, it makes ours look uh, like a, a baby drought. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about 12 years long. Um, so they responded in very different ways to the drought. So Southeast Queensland really focused on conservation. They built a desal plant, so there was some supply augmentation, but it was mainly conservation. Um, and, and then you know the, some of the activities that we talked about here, uh, stormwater capture and so forth, turning to sort of lesser quality water sources. Perth, on the other hand, didn't have a lot in the way of surface water resources, and so they, they went desal big time. And so they built a lot of desal plants. So David likes to talk about path dependency. Basically, those initial decisions by those two different communities on the same continent set them on a completely different path through that sort of energy water space. And so as you can imagine, Perth's trajectory is essentially a straight line up in terms of the energy use. Um, and, uh, and then really mo mo very um, uh, sort of little conservation. Uh, whereas Southeast Queensland had enormous conservation and actually decline in the unit energy used for water. So if you compare those two paths, you know, obviously there were you know, extenuating circumstances that put Perth on the path that it was on, but if you compare those two paths, you'd much rather be on the more sustainable sort of Southeast Queensland path. So it doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think we're, we're probably, if anything, on the, on the Perth path. And, and so, you know, the real question is how we at least split the difference between those two trajectories. Hi, my name is Natalie. Um, I was just wondering, how easy do California water utilities make it to access uh, their data for third parties? Because I come from an energy background, and that's always been a struggle, is getting electric utilities to be able to hand over um, electric data to third party applications who might make it um, more easier for customers to conserve electricity. And I was wondering if you guys have the same difficulties um, with water utilities. So uh, I'll kick it off. Uh, being public agencies, or most water uh, companies are public agencies, there are questions about information confidentiality and privacy that are, are somewhat hard to get around. And utilities certainly have a lot of data on water use, household use. They know who's using it and even sometimes how they're using it. Uh, but the ability to share that data even with the, the particular household user uh, can be a challenge because uh, a lot of that data, you want to make sure that you're protecting privacy, keeping confidentiality. Uh, on the other hand, another challenge is more of a logistical or technological challenge, and that is uh, not every utility, for example, provides a means of, uh, or has the capacity to provide the means for what we might call smart metering. And not only smart metering for water, but smart metering, and there are technologies now available, but they have not been widely disseminated for understanding the amount of water you're using and the amount of energy that you're also using simultaneously to provide that water and vice versa. These could be tremendous information tools for conserving both resources. One of the things, and we uh, had a symposium on this through Water UCI about a year and a half ago on the water energy nexus. California, about 25% 
of our electricity statewide is used to heat, treat, and move water from one place to another. That's a huge amount of electricity for water. If on a household level we could somehow have the instrumentation and the real-time data provided to us about how much water and energy we're using and how they're tied together, knit together, uh, we might be in a better position to conserve. But there are technological challenges, economic challenges in disseminating that technology, diffusing it. Uh, some people don't want to be smart metered because they don't want people to sort of, there's this notion of they're knowing what I'm doing, right? And of course, we live in a, a time when we're all sort of very sensitive as to how these things could diffuse to various forms of social media. Probably doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think it gets at some of the larger issues that are wedded to that. So your question is, is essentially real-time data for like applications that you could have in the home. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm afraid I can't really expand much, except to say that, that as a researcher, and certainly looking at historical data, um, you know, I, I have wonderful partners in the Orange County Public Works, as well as IRWD. So I think that um, certainly, uh, you know, as, as students at UCI and faculty at UCI, it's a, a really great resource, and they're eager to work with us. Because, you know, frankly, they don't have the staff time to think about the bigger picture oftentimes. They're just reacting to the most immediate need. So, uh, so it's been a great partnership. But the real-time stuff, as David pointed out, there's a lot of privacy issues that, and data transfer issues that make it more problematic, I think. So I'm just uh, curious about uh, some of the things that are going on with the aging infrastructure in terms of, I think we were all shocked with the Orville Dam uh, failure. Uh, and also, uh, I know the governor has some fairly ambitious plans in terms of uh, water projects and just maybe a few comments about that. Yeah, um, infrastructure is definitely a challenge. Uh, whether we agree that we should have more of it or less of it, move toward more toward what we call green as opposed to gray infrastructure uh, are important policy issues. But I would say this, once you invest in infrastructure, uh, you also, I think, have a moral commitment uh, publicly to protect it, to preserve it, to repair it, to maintain it, to keep it going. Particularly in a state like California where, and, and I often uh, say this to my students and they, they hear this, you know, despite all of our problems, historically, we've done a pretty good job of harnessing water through infrastructure. It is reliable, uh, it is dependable, it is certainly affordable, uh, but it's been at a cost. And the cost is that, uh, you know, we still have to maintain it. We have to find the political will and the economic resources to repair it. I think that's an obligation we have to future generations. Uh, I think together with that, we also have to get real about how we finance infrastructure. Um, we don't like to hear this, but when we pay our water bill, we're not paying for water. We're paying for water services. We're paying for various agencies that have to employ the best available technology that is known to humanity to address very palpable, very serious issues, not only of water supply, but of water quality and water safety. Uh, I don't believe you can put too high a price on that, personally. But it also means that we have to figure out a way of equitably paying for that. And that means that we have to get real about financing the infrastructure that supports our way of life. Um, I know that I pay a lot more for my cable TV uh, than I do for my water, and yet if I had to make a choice between which of those two things are most important to maintain in terms of infrastructure, you know, push comes to shove, I don't think there would be, be any debate. So infrastructure is important. We have to maintain it. We usually wait until things get very bad, and then it becomes more expensive to fix. 
I guess I would just add that, that um, you know, civil engineers are pretty conservative by nature. I'm, I'm in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, so I can say that. Um, and that means that if you're thinking about um, making that leap to a water 4.0 future, uh, you really need a new kind of infrastructure. Um, and so part of my challenge, and I think departments um, of civil environmental engineering around the country, part of our challenge is really to educate a new workforce that thinks about, for example, the impacts of building a, a conventional stormwater uh, collection and, and discharge system. And you know, alternatives to that system that could in fact green the environment and, and you know, improve water productivity. So, so I think that there's a, you know, kind of a, you know, what can we do? This is such a huge problem while we can raise taxes, as David pointed out. But I think at a university, we have a really unique opportunity to, um, to kind of showcase what can be done. And so that, in fact, is one, what we're trying to do with the, um, the UC Office of the President Award as well, is just experiment. Let's use the campus as an experimental lab. Um, and, and, you know, we'll make mistakes, but we'll have some ho hopefully glorious outcomes as well, which can then serve to diffuse to the rest of the community and, um, you know, lead to a, a more resilient infrastructure. So, so it isn't just decaying. I guess that's the thing I'm trying to say, say is that it's also about revisioning what that infrastructure is going to look like. Hello. Uh, given the success that water reuse, also known as water recycling, has had here in our backyard of Orange County Water District. How come this has been an underutilized resource here in the United States, and do you see that changing in the foreseeable future? I hope it does change. I think one of the, uh, well, I'll start out with the first part of your question. It's an extremely important asset to our water supply here in Orange County. Uh, we have one of the largest wastewater reuse, indirect potable reuse systems in the hemisphere. And it's a remarkable system, not just technologically, but societally in terms of the efforts of outreach, public education, financing, creative uh, jurisdictional cooperation to make that possible. And I think most of all, foresight. Uh, Orange County was one of the first areas in California long before the state found the political courage to pass a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act to actually manage our groundwater basin. We knew that without managing our basin properly, uh, we would have saltwater intrusion from the ocean. Uh, that gave rise to an infrastructure, both physically and politically, that made it possible to look at that groundwater basin as a renewable resource. Then as our population began to grow and we began to develop uh, tremendously in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the search for alternative sources of re resilient supply became more apparent. And the notion of a groundwater replenishment system based on essentially reusing of sewage and processing and treating it to the highest possible standard and then replenishing our groundwater basin together with other harvested stormwater from the Santa Ana River. Uh, is a remarkable engineering feat. And over time, it uh, is likely to reduce our dependency on imported water and ensure that the aquifer, the groundwater basin, becomes a truly sustainable resource. Why not other places is your question, and second part of your question. And the answer, I think, revolves around a number of variables that social scientists are constantly looking at. Uh, one is public trust and confidence in the technology. Another is public trust and confidence in the competence of the people managing the technology. There was a lot of outreach efforts exercised in Orange County to try to address those issues. And I think on a more straightforward level, Orange County uh, promised, you know, we had to promise that that facility could be brought in on time and under budget. That it was from a public choice and a public finance perspective, uh, a truly viable option economically. Uh, Los Angeles is still grappling with the issue of indirect potable reuse in San Fernando Valley. San Diego is, has some plans to have a direct potable reuse system. Uh, in areas where you have environmental justice legacies, in areas where underrepresented groups have historically been excluded from water management decisions, 
uh, in areas where there are not efforts made to incorporate underrepresented groups in decisions, you're likely to get a lot of distrust and a lot of resistance toward the reuse of wastewater for potable use. Uh, the Orange County story is a success. Is it a success that can be replicated with the right conditions? I think so, but it will take efforts on the political and the social front that are at least as ambitious as the engineering front. I would just say that I think sometimes, you know, we, we our human lifespan is so short, we don't necessarily see change, right? Uh, we don't see the sort of massive importance of what's occurring around us. And, and so I can, I can imagine that, that this idea of recycling sewage, you know, in such a you know, systematic way, um, that becoming such an important part of the water supply, will be as important when historians look back a thousand years from now as those beautiful images of the aqueduct are for ancient Rome. So, so it's really interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, communities are going to have some struggles, but as the technology is proven, you know, as more and more communities have to turn to recycled sewage in order to survive, frankly, uh, it'll become a norm and it'll be as significant as the transition to hydraulic society. We are the new Rome. <laughs> or maybe Singapore is so much. Okay, well now to wrap this up, if you liked this program, I'd like to invite you to the next library event, which is an exhibit opening at Langston Library across campus. And so this next exhibit is the costuming the leading ladies of Shakespeare from Stratford to Orange County on April 5th at 5.30 p.m. And I'd also like to say that today's event would not be possible without our partners of the UCI libraries. And so I'd like to invite you all to become a partner. It helps support UCI's world-class research, teaching, and patient care, uh, supports the library's role as an information resource for the community, and helps sponsor public programs like today's. And so now it is time for our reception. I just want you to join me. And one more thank to our speakers, to our student dancers, and to our middle school student artists. Thank you all.